This is the 10X case, Laboratory for the Future. Our esteemed panel includes Justin Aaronworth, President and CEO of the Water Institute of the Gulf. That was the 2018 host of the 10X Water Summit, so we're delighted to have Justin. Bill Fulton, the director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University in Texas. Corinne Letourneau, managing director for 100 Resilient Cities, North American region. And our moderator this morning is Duke Ryder. You've met Duke, he's the senior advisor to the president of ASU. He's the executive director of our office, University City Exchange, and the founder of the 10X Initiative. Session three. Uh. This is on. Uh, don't worry, I will not be on the stage at all times, and I will not be the moderator of every session. But uh, I, I'm delighted to, again, have you all here, set the stage for this, and I couldn't be more pleased to have the people uh, to my left and right to help me do that. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we are so grateful to uh, the Arizona Community Foundation and Steve Sells now, the uh, CEO. Uh, Steve, if you could stand up, we're just so grateful for the support you've given to this project. And uh, she's been referenced several times, and uh, she'll be on the stage next time. She's outside, so I'm not going to ask her to uh, do anything more. But you'll meet Catherine Sorensen, who's the director of the water activity here in the city of Phoenix, a, a hugely uh, important supporter of ours. And uh, there are probably a lot of people in the audience for whom I should do this, and I'm not going to be able to do it all. But I would like to acknowledge Terry Goddard, uh, former mayor of Phoenix and the attorney general of the state of Arizona. I know he's deeply interested in these issues and wanted to be here today. So um, for those of you who were here last night, I reviewed uh, just a little bit as to what Ten Across is all about uh, and why you're here today. We essentially have come to the conclusion that you can see the future of the United States in this quarter, obviously around water, but if you look at the issues of migration and immigration uh, in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, we have representatives here from that city, that's obviously top of mind as the moment. Think about uh, global trade and tariffs and the impact on the ports of Los Angeles and Houston and Baton Rouge and New Orleans and Jacksonville. Or think about the future of fossil fuels, which my friend Bill Fulton uh, I know is going to speak to a little bit as he's representing Houston here today. What is that going to become? And, and as Bill has said, will that just be the fossil fuel capital of the world or the energy capital of the world? So as you look at the major issues of our time, they're beautifully arrayed across the ten. And so exchanges like this suggest how we can tackle them together, as the governor was also suggesting. So that's why we're here today. As I said earlier, nobody here is just a spectator. We hope to build something out of this group. We hope to achieve some things, take on some projects. So expect to be called upon to do that. So I've got three great panelists here who were introduced uh, by Cecilia Rivera, one of the great uh, supporters of the Tent Across Summit. Uh, but I want to start with Corinne. Uh, she is coming to us from Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities. And first of all, for the group, I'd love you to introduce yourself and that project and probably your current definition of resilience as you see it. We'll talk about where you're going forward. Bill. Okay. I'm the managing director oh, there it is, of the North America region at 100 Resilient Cities. Um, and for those of you who might not um, be acquainted with 100 Resilient Cities, we are an organization pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation five years ago upon its 100th anniversary um, to work with 100 cities across the globe to help them identify their core risks um, institutionalize resilience in city government and identify innovative solutions and programs and initiatives to address those core risks. And so we do that in the formation of a grant that funded a chief resilience officer 
and there's some alumni chief resilience officers in the room today. There's some current chief resilience officers in the room today, um, and I'm sure they're going to talk to you a little bit about what it means to be a chief resilience officer in a municipality. Um, and we also coordinate with those cities and partner with them on developing a resilient strategy, which is a strategy around what are our core shocks and stresses that our city is facing today, um, and how are we going to address those core shocks and stresses. So that's a good lead into what is our definition of resilience. Our definition of urban resilience is really about cities looking at the shocks and stresses at the same time. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's the ability of a city, a community, an institution, a system to adapt and thrive no matter what challenge it actually faces. That's the definition of urban resilience, but we really take a strong view at 100 Resilient Cities to ensure that cities look at holistically across all their city systems at the core shocks and stresses and find ways to integrate those issues together. You're right. We do have some of your uh, chief resilience officers in the room. So your selection of cities, uh, 100th anniversary and limited to 100, I get that. You've just added one, I understand. We're going to hear about it in a little bit. But how did you determine which cities would be in the cohort when you initially assembled them? What did you expect to have happen in those places once designated? That's a, that's a great question. We had over 1,100 applicants. Um, we did kind of three rounds of applications and accepted about 33 cities initially in each round. And we really looked at having different scales and different typologies of cities to ensure that they could learn from each other. So, you know, if you take North America alone, we have 29 cities here across Canada and the US alone. That is a huge cohort of cities to learn from each other. And they're at completely different scales and typologies and have differing issues, right? So you have the mega cities of New York and Los Angeles, but we also work with the city of Berkeley um, and Boulder, which are smaller cities of 100,000 people, but have a lot of innovative innovative spirit in those cities being university towns. Um, so we really, I think, had tried to identify cities that were um, able and ready and had a high level of kind of resilience planning already happening, but then other cities that were maybe farther behind and could learn from those cities. But I will tell you, any city we selected that did come into the cohort saying, oh, we already know what we are doing, we don't need, we're way advanced in this space. We never accepted that as an answer. Um, us at 100 Resilient Cities, and you could ask the Chief Resilience Officers, I think um, really pushed with those cities to really kind of try to think creatively and think outside the box and understand that maybe there's a, a, a shock or stress they haven't identified. There's another creative way to be looking at it. We really wanted them to leverage our partnership in new ways. So we also looked for cities that were willing and able to do that as well that we're willing to kind of partner with us on this journey to kind of build this movement. So I know you're interested in the analytics uh, of what you've done, the successes, and how to measure that. And if I think about uh, a person and or an organization who's dedicated to that very topic, that would be my good friend Justin Aaronworth to my right, uh, representing the Water Institute of the Gulf. And, and I can't overemphasize how valuable the partnership uh, for the 10X project has been with uh, uh, the Water Institute of the Gulf and frankly the Baton Rouge Area Foundation and John Davies who's in the room as our other colleagues from the Gulf areas. As I've said to others, uh, they bring a sense of urgency to the 10X project because I spent 10 years of my life in that part of the country. Uh, the waters of climate change are literally lapping at their doorstep. They've lost 2,000 square miles schedule, unfortunately, to lose many more. So what the Water Institute of the Gulf is doing is urgent, and I think we can all learn from that, because our problems out here are slower in nature. So, Justin, if you could talk about the organization, how it was founded, the, the, the momentum that you have behind it, behind it, and we'll get to this issue of measuring results, because I know you're very dedicated to that topic. Great. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Duke. Um, this is really exciting. So we had the first uh, 10X meeting uh, last year in Baton Rouge uh, in our building uh, on the water campus. And it's worth saying a little something about that water campus, and I'll, I'll come back to it and what the Water Institute is, because where we are is so important uh, to, to who we are. 
So uh, after Hurricane Katrina, a bunch of people from Louisiana, uh, leaders including the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, uh, Senator Mary Landrieu, and a, a number of other leaders from our community got together and said, clearly we have a water problem. Uh, what we need to do is look around the world and figure out who has dealt with this set of challenges the best. And as the scan took place, uh, it didn't take long for people to buy plane tickets to the Netherlands. And our group started going to the Netherlands and observed what the Dutch had been doing. They, of course, have been defending their coastline for the last 800 years. And in 1953, they had what was akin to our Hurricane Katrina moment. In 1953, the terrible uh, flood, the dikes broke, and they said to themselves, never again. And they went forward and built remarkable structures that I'm sure many of you have seen, but they also invested deeply in the science, in the analytics. Uh, and when our group from Louisiana uh, toured around, they came across an entity called Deltaris, which is really the premier applied uh, research uh, organization doing uh, coastal and deltaic uh, research in the world. Uh, it's a remarkable organization, 850 people working in some 40 countries, and they're very impressed with, with, with what they saw. So they came back to Louisiana and said, that Deltaris was pretty impressive. Uh, we need to get us one of them. And that was really the founding of the... That is the way you would talk. In it is the way, and that was exactly the way it was said, Duke. Um, uh, and so that was what happened. So in, in 2011, 2012, uh, my predecessor, a brilliant hydrologist named Chip Grote, who had led the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey for Presidents Clinton and Bush, uh, put together a team. And we're now about uh, 50 people from uh, almost a dozen different countries. And we, we approached this set of issues. And Duke, Duke laid it out very nicely. We are in an existential land loss crisis uh, in Louisiana. We lose a football field of land every 100 minutes. Duke said it. We, we've lost 2,000 square miles. That's about the size of Rhode Island. I mean, countries would go to war to defend that much uh, land. And what's very interesting in Louisiana, not to talk politics before, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, but we don't spend... We've already done that earlier. Oh, good. So All right. We got that out of the way. We don't, we, you know, red-blue states, we don't spend a lot of time talking about uh, the set of issues that get really um, uh, hot around uh, climate change, frankly. Because as Duke said, we see it in our, at our doorstep. There are places where people used to go fishing, uh, holes that are now open water. Uh, our landscape is changing. So we live in a delta, which of course means change is, is, has always taken place. And uh, in our landscape, there was this great moment in 1927 when we had the big flood. And the United States government response to that was to put levees all along the Mississippi River. Great levees that have done, for the most part, a pretty good uh, job on the river. But what we knew at that time and what we are, and the check has come due, is that traditionally the river would flood and the sediment from 40% of the continental United States would replenish our land, would replenish our delta. Well, because we built these very successful levees, instead of that sediment replenishing the land, it goes off the outer continental shelf. And so we have that land loss crisis. It's contributed to, so you got that part, You've got the fact that we've cut oil and gas canals, so you have seawater sea coming in, which is, gives us saltwater intrusion issues. Uh, then we have subsidence from uh, pumping groundwater. We have hurricanes and storms. So we have a, a huge set of challenges. Because of that set of challenges, we have been forced to develop some of the most innovative thinking. So we have a 50-year, a $50 billion master plan that is based on the best uh, science in the world. We're, we're very proud of it. And we're now moving into the implementation of that plan and the financing of it. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit, Duke, about who we are and, and why it is that we have been forced to put the best minds in the world on the set of uh, very difficult challenges. And, and Justin mentioned that we had the first water summit in Baton Rouge for all the reasons that he just mentioned, including the partnerships that we've established with that uh, region of the country but he's underselling the building we were in. Uh, I think we inaugurated it uh, last May. There are some trifold brochures out front, or you can Google it. L you should see this building. It could not have been better. Uh, we're in the spectacular contemporary design. As an architect, I appreciated that. We're looking at the Mississippi River because it's right, it's hovering over the river, and there's the bridge uh, with I-10 traffic on it, which was packed throughout the duration of the conference. So there was a confluence of all these ideas brought together there. Your thoughts about the dramatic difference between the landscape that you have and what we have here and the uh, uh, pairing of those two things, what's the benefit to you in that? And what do you see that you, we could learn from what you're doing? It's obviously not in the particulars on the ground. It's in something else. I think the key element for us and what we're always so interested to learn about 
is how do you pair the physical and natural world, the physical and natural sciences with the social sciences? So in Louisiana, of course, and throughout the Gulf of Mexico, uh, adaptation is not just something we talk about. There are communities that are being moved now uh, that wish they could stay, but the land doesn't exist any longer. The word retreat is in your vocabulary. And, and, and it's, it's newer, right? There used to be, in the old days, meaning five years ago, politicians elected statewide in Louisiana would never use the word resettlement. That was a death sentence for an elected official. We've moved past that. There's an understanding that this is what's happening. And so for us, what we're so interested in, we spend a lot of our, our research and our scholarship is based on how do you bring the best ideas on the physical natural side? You know, for us, we are, we're, we're, we're studying how to divert the Mississippi River, cut holes in the levee and put big controlled projects there where you can allow the sediment and water to flow to rebuild the land. That's on the physical natural side. But what do we do to be, to be thoughtful around the process of human uh, adaptation? What we're trying to do and what we're very interested in learning from others' experiences is how do we, for the, for the most part, as best we can, get politics out of the equation? How do we look at things and try to not uh, 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 prejudice one community against another because one community has greater political power than another? We know no matter how much money we, we, we can get our hands on that it will never be enough to do everything we would like to do. So how do you make those gut-wrenching decisions? Which homes are elevated? Which homes are not? Who is asked to leave? How is somebody asked to leave? So these are, 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 are questions that in, in Arizona and in the desert you are grappling with in a, in a, in a very different way. Some of those key insights are uh, what, we're, what we're... So uh, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce you to my friend Bill Fulton, who's the director of the Kinder Institute uh, at Rice University. He is truly a creature of the I-10. He migrated to that position from Los Angeles, where he held all kinds of positions there uh, as a mayor in Ventura, I believe, and uh, is, is one of the great urban thinkers in this country. You can read many of his columns in Governing Magazine, but he is really, uh, I think, uh, re-energized in terms of his outlook on the prospects of cities by his new situation in Houston. Interestingly enough, Justin's organization is helping with a resiliency plan for Houston, but Bill can see, if you will, the entirety of the spectrum of activity across the 10, and we both have a passion for Sunbelt cities and what they mean, because they are different. So, Bill, maybe you want to talk a bit about your work and, and how you see the Kinder Institute really helping to shape the future of Houston. Thanks, Duke, and good morning, everybody, and thanks for, for having, <clears throat> having us here again this year. Um, you know, Duke's right that I have spent most of my life along the I-10 corridor. I like to uh, I like to needle my friends in Houston by calling the I-10 the Santa Monica Freeway. Um, <laughs> they <laughs> they don't like that very much. Um, uh, but, but but I and it is and it is interesting that I've spent most of my adult life in the two largest cities in the I-10 corridor, uh, uh, Los Angeles and Houston. Um, uh, Duke's right that these cities, well, first of all, these cities, these 11 cities, major cities along the I-10 corridor, account for something like, the, the metro areas at least, account for something like a third of American population growth. It is an enormous number. There is an enormous number. Um, uh, Houston, along with Dallas, uh, uh, is the fastest growing uh, by, by in sheer numbers um, uh, a metropolitan area in the country. Uh, the other thing, obviously, that we all know is that these cities are different from the older cities in the north, northeast and the midwest, which in urban policy circles are typically called the HUD cities. Those are the cities that have all the public housing projects. Those are the cities where, where, uh, where HUD policy uh, is, is most obviously applied. Um, and these cities are characterized by a wide variety of things, right? They are, um, um, they're auto-oriented, they're newer, although not as new as you might think at this point. Um, uh, uh, they are characterized very often, particularly Houston and Los Angeles, by uh, various things being scattered randomly across the landscape, right? In, in Houston, for example, the port of entry neighborhood, which is called Gulfton, uh, is not in a logical location at all. It is located outside of the I-610 loop uh, in an area that has lousy bus service, uh, no pedestrian facilities. Uh, uh, pedestrians get killed all the time. Very, a lot of people don't have cars. Um, so I think there's a whole series of issues that these, most of these cities uh, uh, have in common. They are newer, 
um, uh, they are auto-oriented and they, have st they are coming up against, against the limits of what an auto-oriented city can be. Um, uh, 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 they are uh, growing really fast. Uh, and all of them, as uh, has been indicated through this whole thing, uh, have various issues with water. Uh, too much or too little or both, right? Uh, in Houston, over the last 10 years, we've, we've, we've had problems with both too much and, and too little water. I think also one thing that is uh, not always understood is the level of environmental risk that these human settlements uh, have. Um, Houston being, I think, the most dramatic example. Obviously, New Orleans is a good example. Los Angeles with the, with the, with the risk of, 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 of earthquakes, also an example. But Houston, in particular, is a, a profound example of, of rapid population growth, robust economy, and ex as we learned in the last week, uh, extreme environmental risk, uh, particularly along the ship channel between the petrochemical plants and the oil refineries. And so we have to figure out how to transform these cities into effective 21st century, both sustainable and resilient cities. And, and I think if we can do it along the I-10 corridor, we can do it anywhere. By the way, I think you should also speak to something that I think people also don't know about uh, Houston and, and frankly Texas, uh, the demographic shifts there and the diversity uh, that's represented in the city of Houston. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Yeah, Houston uh, does remind me, especially of Los Angeles in that, in that sense, uh, there are, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an article in the New York Times today, I believe, about how Houston uh, uh, is known, uh, has become known as the food, not the, just the space capital of the country, but the food capital of the country. In fact, the Washington Post food writer a while ago said, if, if Los Angeles and New Orleans had a baby, it would be Houston. Um, uh, but Houston has, and, and that is a result of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the ethnic diversity. Houston has more Vietnamese uh, than anywhere else in the United States outside of California. It has no, more Nigerians uh, anywhere except Nigeria. It has, I believe, more South Asians anywhere in the U U.S. outside of New York. It, like Los Angeles, it's 40% Hispanic. Um, uh, it is a, it is a and, and it is a, tra and because it's relatively inexpensive compared to the coastal cities, and extremely robust, and already has those ethnic enclaves. It is. It is. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, knowing people who grew up in LA, it is. It is now an attractor uh, for uh, particularly successful uh, uh, folks of all of all ethnicities uh, looking for a place to, to build their life now. By the way, you mentioned something in that discussion about if LA and New Orleans had a baby, it'd be Houston. There's some interesting. Uh, 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 let's go, rivalries uh, across the 10. I remember having spent 10 years of my life in New Orleans, they said, let's hope we don't become Houston. Matter of fact, there's a, a notorious article in the Atlantic, which is constantly reprinted. Now being in Phoenix, when I got here, well, I hope we don't become LA. And I'm thinking, I'm-, I'm Except I'm, even though everybody who's moving to Phoenix is coming from LA. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> everybody I, for a while who came to Houston came from New Orleans, right? Yeah, and I think it's because these cities see their future to some extent, because that's where the growth is gonna be. And so that is coming, and are we ready for it? And, and you mentioned growth, just the preparedness of these cities for that growth. What would be your assessment of that? Because you're right, we've got the fastest growing county here in Maricopa, all these cities are growing. The, the relationship of growth and preparedness to receive growth. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that'll be addressed more in the next panel. Probably. But, but I will say, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Houston politics, uh, the Harris County judge, the county executive, Ed Emmett, was just defeated for re-election, and, and, and uh, he landed at our place as a senior fellow at the Kinder Institute. And if you're familiar with Houston, we have three ring roads, the last one being the Grand Parkway, and Judge Emmett is really the godfather of the Grand Parkway. Uh, and, and, and Ed said to me the other day in private, I'm not sure he's ready to say this out loud yet, but he said, this, he said in private, there will be no ring road no more ring roads around Houston because the next ring road around Houston would basically go between Austin and San Antonio. Now, that's how far out it would have to be, right? And so I, 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 we are at a place in Houston, and I think a lot of the I-10 cities are in this place where you have to start thinking about looking inward. Some, that is happening. Um, uh, you, you can't just assume, uh, even if you could go further out, uh, you are a long way from job centers. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a whole new, I think, 
um, uh, a paradigm for how to accommodate growth uh, that is going to have to emerge that we see emerging in these cities in fits and starts. I would say Los Angeles uh, uh, is further along this this continuum than any of the other cities, but but you see just in the neighborhood where we are, and and the investment that ASU has made in downtown Phoenix is a good example. We are struggling to find. Uh, a new paradigm of how to accept growth in the Sun Belt uh, in a non-traditional way because the because uh, I can tell you the biggest problem with accepting growth in Houston is the attenuation of public services uh, across a vast area has become uh, impossible to manage. And I, uh, as Bill reminds us, we don't want to steal the thunder from the next panel because you will hear from representatives of the four of the eight largest cities in the United States, all of whom are thinking about growth, I, I know my good friend Catherine Sorensen is, will water be that delimiter or not? So uh, that you'll, you'll hear more about that. Uh, so Corinne, coming back to you. So 100 resilient cities, you've been in business for five years. Uh, I think you had the Urban Institute do a report, an assessment by a third party uh, of your successes, maybe things you want to do in the future. How do you measure success with regard to resilience as you have in the past and might going forward? How do you think about that? Sure. I, I just want to make one comment on growth. I know there's a panel later. Um, this has been across the 29 cities in North America, one of the most constant pieces in their resilience challenges is, is the growing inequality of the cities and how growth is impeding on that. And so it's just very important for, I think, everyone to realize when you bring a resilience perspective to something just as simple as kind of your housing strategy, how do you build in kind of an adaptive and different way of thinking when you're thinking about the, your city of the future? Um, and so I think it, that's just a perfect example of why we, we have such a holistic view of resilience um, because we want cities to just be thinking about how they reimagine themselves um, and ensure that you know growth is part of your resilience strategy and you are thinking creatively about new neighborhoods and new development and bringing in the transportation planner, bringing in the housing planner, bringing in your, your, your flood expert, your water expert at the table together to really kind of think about that, that forward thinking view. Has anybody laid out a plan as a result of your work who, that you think this might be the template for others to follow or who's already doing it well? Anybody that you would point us to? I would say all of the cities that have re released resilience strategies Bad. are doing that well. Um, I think what has been interesting, and this dovetails with your question about the Urban Institute report, is that what what this outside evaluator found uh, our biggest successes in the last five years really has been about getting cities to plan and act differently and institutionalizing resilience in the city. So we funded one chief resilience officer, yet that chief resilience officer through developing the resilience strategy is, cr is the conductor of the orchestra. And the players of that orchestra are the different heads of different agencies, different city commissions, different water bureaus, et cetera, that are deeply starting to understand a resilient way of thinking and wanting to come to the table around projects that don't just impact their agency. That's been, I think, one of the biggest success factors that we have found. So I would say, for instance, along our cities, along the I-10 corridor, there's been huge successes in cities such as Los Angeles that have found ways to look at the LA River as an integrate resilient system and have done some projects on thinking about how do we make sure that anything we're doing or developing along the river thinks about affordability at the same time as flood risk. We have projects in El Paso which are looking at kind of what, how do we integrate green infrastructure, but also think about the social elements of green infrastructure and think about how that could be a job creation program at the same time as developing the green infrastructure. And then of course, there's a multitude of examples in New Orleans, the Gentilly Resilience District being one of the, the, the top examples um, where they're able to kind of look at how do you actually create a resilience district and think creatively about not just looking at the flood risk, but looking at, at the social fabric of that neighborhood and how any, any projects or pieces happening at play can actually benefit those residents and help lift them up at the same time. 
So linking these two things up, uh, obviously 100 resilient cities is as described. The focus is on cities, and, and I think people, uh, cities have been having a moment for quite some time. People are really interested in what they are. But Justin, you're charged with a much larger ecosystem in which uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans and a whole lot of the surrounding area is involved. Uh, how do these scales and observation of these scales work together? And not to mention the urban-rural divide that's mentioned often in this country and people feeling as though they're being ignored. You've, you're charged with a big mission, and you've got a lot of people observing that area with all kinds of technologies and otherwise. How do you decide how to scope down your work or, or scale it up? Well, you, you're, you're right. We, we do, uh, in our work, really look at the landscape, uh, landscape level. And one of the, there's sort of two things, I think, that we're particularly excited about and encouraged around. One, and this is building off of, uh, uh, off of all the comments that have been made so far this morning, we're investing deeply in adaptive management. So our idea as a scientific applied research group is that we'll put our best ideas forward, but there have to be rigorous adaptive management regimes put in place where you are constantly updating your thinking, constantly updating the operation of any particular uh, project. So that's sort of a structural piece. The, the, the big exciting move that has, uh, has been made, and there are a number of our partners in this room working on it, uh, we've been funded by J.P. Morgan Chase to look at how can you scale nature-based defenses. So in the Gulf of Mexico, this is particularly important and, and, and critical, really. Uh, there is, of course, a great deal of oil and gas. Uh, we have areas like, uh, I'll use the example of, of Port Fouchon, which is at the very end, we call it the end of the earth, lovingly. It is if you drive all the way down south Louisiana until you can drive no further. And it's a, it's a port. It services 100% of all the offshore oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico, which is not just important for Louisiana, but is a national economic security matter. I think about $2 trillion worth of infrastructure in the Gulf. That's right. That's right. And so we have been promoting the concept of nature-based defenses. And the example in, in this geography is that port is going to dredge to 50 feet. They're going to do it because they want to service larger vessels that are currently being serviced in Singapore and other countries. And so when they dredge to 50 feet, I talked earlier about our, our sediment starvation issues, that's going to create somewhere between 20 and, and 35 million cubic yards of material immediately, which is a gold mine for us. Traditionally, that material either gets dumped somewhere at the lowest cost or it gets put on the backside of the port to comply with mitigation, et cetera. What we're doing instead now, in partnering with the Dutch, is using our numerical modeling capabilities to look at where do you put that material to build what would be the largest restoration project in the history of Louisiana and the, and the Gulf of Mexico um, to, to, to get at least four outcomes. So you put that material where it's now open water, you get wave attenuation and erosion prevention benefits, so you're protecting the infrastructure. Two, you're creating new habitat, so it's good for the environment. Three, uh, there's a community resilience benefit where we're going to reduce nuisance flooding in communities that service that port. And four, in this geography, we're going to introduce black mangroves. And their roots do an excellent job of keeping the material together, but they're also excellent at capturing carbon. So instead of dumping the material off the outer continental shelf, we're, we're using models to figure out where you can put it to, to protect infrastructure, improve the environment, capture carbon, and promote community resilience. In our geography, in particular around uh, Texas and Louisiana, unfortunately people tend to sue each other a lot, pointing the finger, saying it's your fault, it's your fault. Well, with this project and with this methodology, instead of people suing one another, we have everybody standing on the side of the angels as we see it, using the best science to make these, uh, to make these decisions. And so the example I gave is in that geography in, around Fushan, but we're looking at those very same opportunities all along the, uh, the Texas coast, with the knowledge and understanding that you don't have to choose to protect the environment or is it an economic development uh, project. You really can couple these to be, to be both. So Duke, I think that methodology is one we're particularly excited about. And, and, and I'm gonna migrate this question from you and then to Bill, because he's mentioned before. This requires the convergence of interest about, around some of the players who might have been pointed at or to, uh, some of whom are in the petrochemical industries. Are you finding a way to find common purpose with these folks? And is it real? Is it, is it authentic? What's really happening? The exciting move in our experience in this is that the petrochemical companies who are now funding this work, um, at first, frankly, they were drawn to the conversation from the corporate social responsibility side of their operation. That was what brought them into the room. But then the operational side of the organization, which frankly is where all the, the big funding exists, they looked at these kind of projects and said, you know what, we can't build seawalls high enough. We can't, we need this. You know, Jeff Abair, I'm sure, can talk about um, the, the way that the city of New Orleans 
uses the multiple lines of defense strategy. We have our, 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 our levees and our walls, but we also need those wetlands to protect that, that, that infrastructure. That's our mindset for all of coastal Louisiana and, and beyond. So really, this methodology took fire, uh, caught on fire, if you will, um, when the operational side was brought into the, into the conversation and realized that it's, it's a critical element to maintaining their business model. And Bill, you mentioned I think people don't understand the relationship between water and energy. And when we come to Houston next year, we'll probably dig into that topic. But, but you want to go a little further into that? Uh, well, a, a couple of things, actually. The, the, the first one is that with modern uh, oil and gas technology, there is more water used by far. Secondly, the thing, uh, you mentioned the Port of Houston, uh, which is one of the largest ports in the country, but that is that is largely because of, of, of oil and gas in and out uh, 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 through uh, on, on tankers. Uh, you, um, you know, Houston's at an interesting point. Everybody thinks that Houston has always been the oil and gas capital and never anything else. But, but one interesting historical fact about Houston is that, is that it became the oil capital of the country, of the world, uh, because it had been the cotton trading capital of the South. And so when oil was discovered at Spindletop in 1901 or whenever it was, Houston was the only large city with any proximity to the oil fields that had an economic infrastructure already from cotton trading. Houston had had uh, bankers, Houston had, um, had railroads and things like that. In fact, the Rice University was originally endowed with a cotton trading fortune. So um, uh, Houston uh, has already been through a major economic transition. The, the, the question is how quickly uh, will it go through the next transition and how much will that, it, it, will, will that be embraced? And I, and I think that um, uh, to some extent you see the large oil and gas companies um, uh, uh, trying, a, it's a little bit like the Detroit companies and autonomous vehicles and, and Lyft and Uber, you know, they're kind of okay, this is maybe the future, you know, alternative energies, maybe the future, so how do we embrace it? But then I think you're gonna see a long period of time where these intermediate technologies uh, are become important and Houston could be a center of that. We're about to undertake a, a project with the Cynthia George Mitchell Foundation where we are gonna work with the petrochemical companies and the oil companies to look at opportunities uh, to clean up um, uh, the air along the ship channel uh, through carbon capture efforts, for example. I think there's be a, a long period of transition where, where uh, the environment will be improved through efforts like that. And getting back to my original comments about framing Ten Across, uh, the Permian Basin is in the Ten Across region, obviously, you know, in, in New Mexico and Texas. So the idea that fossil fuel extraction is going to stop in the near future is unlikely. We're going to have to work through that. But again, it's uncanny how this, this transect across the country continues to reveal the big issues of our time uh, as we try to make those transitions. Corinne, coming back to uh, you and what you've done, looking forward for resilient cities. What have you learned? What might you want to do in the future that maybe you haven't done yet? Uh, I know you just designated your 101st city, which would be Houston. Uh, so we're, we're thrilled about that. And Justin is working on the plan. But as you roll out the, your program for the future, what do you want to try to accomplish? Well, I think what's, what, what we've learned and what we want to accomplish, one key piece is the power of these networks, the network of cities learning from each other. And I think that's, it, it's very important to put that point here at home in, at the, as you look at the 10 X cities and how they could learn from each other. Um, I said we had 29 cities in North America. We have a hundred cities across the globe that are, most people think are so different in scale and scope and population and geography that there's, there's not enough similarities to learn from each other. But there are so many similarities to learn from each other is one of the key pieces we've learned. If you look at the five cities we work with across 10X, you'd be fascinated to learn how much they actually have in common in their resilience strategies Which around sure their risks. people know who they are, so. Sorry, sorry. so that would be um, Los Angeles, El Paso, Juarez, Houston now, and New Orleans. Right. Um, and just, you name those and people would say, so vastly different, all of those cities. But if you kind of do the analysis of the risks that they identified in their process with us, you see everyone's trying to adapt to climate change. 
everyone's dealing with urban heat island effect, but also everybody's dealing with issues around economic insecurity for their residents. Everybody's dealing with racial inequity that's bubbling up at the surface in these cities. And so what these chief resilience officers have done is they've learned the mantra, the great mantra of city government, beg, borrow, and steal. Right? How do we learn from each other? How can we adapt to what they've already learned? They were out in front of this. How can we learn from New Orleans, what they dealt with? And how can we adapt that to our city? So I think the networks are so critical. The second big learning really is the power of the multi-sectoral approach, the power of breaking down silos, the power of having all those different agencies at the room to create an initiative that has multiple benefits. These are the initiatives that are going to change our cities. These are the initiatives that are gonna be able to leverage multiple forms of financing, right? That it's not just looking at that one silo of flooding and thinking about just that one engineering way to deal with it, but how do we think about different perspectives and think about adaptability at the forefront? And then the last piece, I think every chief resilience officer and that I think 100 resilient cities is smartly thinking about for the future is, how do you actually finance this risk? And what, it, what are the financing capabilities that cities need to be thinking about and innovating to, th to, really, to really implement these large scale projects and protect their citizens? So I think resilience financing is kind of the next horizon um, that I'll put out there for everyone in this room to be thinking about and trying to think about creatively. How do we get the private sector to help finance some of this risk? How do we really get the federal government to kind of finance things before the disaster happens? These are, this is the next horizon that I think our cities are, are at the forefront of and I believe the 10X cities could be at the forefront of. And two of our panels this afternoon after lunch will go directly to the issue of risk. And I'm looking at my good friend Alex in the front row and how we might form something together, as well as the role of the public sector in helping do that in the last panel before we adjourn for the day. So you've, there's a series of nested foci. You've mentioned cities and, and what's happening within governments. And then you sort of draw out a, a little bit further. As we look across uh, 10 across, the urban-rural divide in every respect how, how do the three of you see that? What, what do we need to do uh, to overcome what is both a, a hot button issue in so many ways, but also a, a reality? I mean, certain places are not, are struggling. Cities, to some extent, are thriving. Uh, they've got their issues as well. What, what about the connection between the way all of you think about your work and those uh, constituents in either a city or an urban center and in between? Well, I think, to, I think of two things. Uh, one is that um, I think we need to understand that there is an important connection between cities and their hinterlands, right? That, that, um, that cities are still the economic drivers of our, of our society and that wealth is created largely in cities and metropolitan areas, and that's good for everybody. Uh, secondly, though, and this is a really interesting trend, I'm not sure how far it's gonna go, but there is increasing discussion about the fact that the federal government in particular in the past um, actually had a bunch of, of policies designed to, to, to create geographical balance uh, with it about prosperity. Da uh, dating back to the New Deal, but not just the New Deal, uh, um, uh, uh, the, and deregulation in many ways, for example, airline deregulation has, has, has taken that apart. Now, um, uh, it, uh, so I think one of the things we can think about as we think about the I-10 corridor and 10 across is, is there a way to make sure that the, that the rural areas um, all, get a piece of the wealth uh, that is created in the cities? I, 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 it's a very, particularly in Texas, uh, I was just testifying in front of the Texas House Urban Affairs Committee, um, uh, uh, which is made up mostly of people who don't live in, uh, representatives who are not from urban areas. And, and, and the disconnect in Texas between the political, uh, 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 the, the, the predominant political factions in Austin, which are largely from exurban and rural areas, and the demographic and economic power of Texas, which is largely along the I-10 corridor, plus Austin and Dallas, is really, really striking. And, and um, so I, I wonder whether there might be policy solutions 
that would uh, encourage the spreading of that uh, prosperity outside of the cities and along the corridor to, to some of the other areas, as there have been in the past. I think Rural you, electrification, for example. I think you picked up one of the common denominator elements of the states across, ten across, for the most part. I mean, what you just described is Arizona. Uh, absolutely. Or North Carolina. Yeah. Right. And, and I think... Or uh, Georgia. Uh, or as, as my brother lives in Georgia said the other day, he said, Georgia's Mississippi with a city. <laughs> and, and as your moderator last night, uh, Sarah Porter, I know, talks about the way we're going to resolve water issues here is a combination of what the cities need as they're growing, and I think that's where a lot of GDP is, so we have to make sure that we support that. But the solutions are going to be found outside the cities with regard to agriculture and the cooperation of those areas. So, so their, their fortunes are really conjoined. I very much agree with that, and I think one of the, the other pieces I would add is, is, you know, in our work we tend to deal with too much water. There's, the, the, the challenges of too much water exist, obviously, in cities, but also in, in rural areas. Uh, in 2016, in Louisiana, we saw vast flooding, uh, flooding that impacted urban environments, but also impacted rural environments. And um, uh, it's been said already, and I'm sure it will be said many times uh, as, as we go on today and tomorrow, getting ahead of it whether you're in a, an urban environment or a rural environment, that I think is the key common denominator that goes across the 10. That uh, our Dutch friends tell us every time we, we visit with them, you know, you Americans are very good at responding to disasters. You're probably the best in the world at it, but you are just horrible at making the investment on the front end to minimize and mitigate the, the, the impact. And I think that is a common denominator across the I-10 and, uh, and beyond. And what hopefully uh, uh, groups like this um, will be able to do is to, is to force that political challenge, right? Because it's very easy for elected officials to uh, run to a disaster and, and respond to it, um, and oftentimes very well. But it's very difficult to say, we need to, with all the challenges that we've got, whether in an urban or rural environment, with all the challenges that we have around crime and education, uh, drug abuse, et cetera, what we really need to do is uh, invest deeply with a lot of resources in these challenges that are 5, 10, 50 years ahead of us. It's very challenging, and I think that's something that we, as a collective, can, can try to uh, push. Because of the d geography described by 10 across, if this project is anything, it's what you do know, how did you know it, and then what did you do about it? I mean, because having lived in New Orleans, it was clear that it was unprepared, and it knew it was unprepared, uh, and still is to this day. And so how do you get ahead of things when they're not right in your face? Um, so uh, I I'd like to open this up for some questions. I have a killer question for my panelists at the end. Uh, that just dawned on me while I'm sitting up here. So I'll save that. But uh, I'd love to hear uh, some observations or thoughts from uh, those of you uh, uh, that you might want to pose to this distinguished panel. Anyone out there? Yes, sir. Do you, do you want to repeat the question since we didn't get the mic there quickly enough? Go, go ahead. Um, Mr. Aaronworth, what lessons do you think could be learned from Louisiana's experience with relocating inundated communities that could be applied to helping communities that might need to be relocated because of a lack of water? I, I think the key insight in our experience is the upfront work with the communities. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about it. I mean, everybody, of course, does community meetings. And, you know, you get your three minutes at the microphone is a very common way. There have been some deeper community engagement um, processes. The thing that we've, I think, really learned from and what we're trying to devote a great deal of our work in right now is that to the extent that the decisions are to be made on, on the best science, whether physical, natural, or social science, um, that needs to be very apparent to everybody who's impacted. The worst thing that you could see in the, in the, you know, the post-Katrina experience, uh, you may have heard of the green dot uh, uh, disaster of basically people telling others your community is gonna be impacted in the following way without that engagement. One of the things that we're, we're devoting a lot of uh, time and energy into right now, we're calling it participatory modeling. And essentially the idea is that the numerical models that we look at from the physical natural side, what we're doing is we're getting the modelers outside of their uh, uh, computer, uh, away from the screen, and into the communities uh, to actually talk about how it is that we're, we're making these decisions. Uh, and what we do is we invite, we, we explain what, these, what the science is, but then we say, well, you've lived here for five generations. What do you think we should do? 
and we take those ideas and we actually put them into the numerical model and we come back and we say, well, you know, there are five ideas. Turns out that the idea that, uh, that, that Colleen had here, we put it into the model and it performed exactly the way she thought. And then the idea that Justin had, well, you know what, actually it turns out that when the tide is coming in this way, your idea, did. the point of it all is to be able to say that you've been heard, that some really innovative ideas come not just from the scientists, but from the people who've been living in particular geography, and that at the end of the process, when decisions are made, when tough, gut-wrenching decisions are made, people understand why. They understand it's not based on politics. It's not based on somebody in a back room making a decision, but that they're, they're truly engaged. That's a long process. It's an expensive process. But in our experience, there's no shortcut. And I think that's a great question, and you'll hear more about it, I think, in the next panel. You might want to ask it again. But uh, the ability to live anywhere you want, which has been the American dream, and I, th I think uh, our friend John Ross talked about Manifest Destiny in the West, maybe we can't, including how to get water from here to there in the desert the same way you may not be able to live everywhere you want along the coast. Uh, yes, right in the front here. Great comments and, uh, and a, a great panel. I was at the uh, Ten Across last year and, and just an unbelievable facility. And, and uh, I mean, your comments are so spot on. I'll follow up with you later, actually. My question is for uh, Corinne. And, and you know, you talked about uh, holistic solutions and, you know, bringing, you know, breaking down the silos. How does that work in practice, say, we're in a city where you've had, had great success? You know, I, I try to do that as a scientist on a smaller scale, and, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge, and I'll be honest, I think there's the brilliance of breaking down the silos in planning, and then there's the breaking down the silos when you're actually implementing the project. And so I think the key finding we have is how do you build that, that governance system or have the leadership that prioritizes the project to ensure that that, that that, that those multiple sectors that are at the table remain at the table throughout the project, right? Um, and so we've seen some best practices from, um, so I worked really closely throughout my career at 100 Resilient Cities with the city of Boston. And what, what they did in kind of the mayor's first few years in office is they, they had a multiple planning processes happening at the same time, which I think to some of us concerned us, we were like, what, you know, what are they doing? But I think it, it created the leadership mandate that said, you know, if, if you are developing any project, you have to ensure that resilience and racial equity is built into that project. And so dovetailing our resilience strategy, they came out with the Resilient Boston Harbor Plan, which is their plan around kind of what they could do around climate resilience along the harbor. And basically that plan ensured that all the different stakeholders from the different entities were at the table and are implementing because it was driven through that mayor's leadership, that these are the goals of my administration and therefore initiatives have to be driven in the same way, right? So it, it, it takes leadership, it takes governance, um, and something that we do at as 100 RC is sometimes we, we, we have found it's helpful to come in and, and be the resilience value police. So cities will ask us when we're implementing a project, do you have any tools or methods or approaches that you can bring to the table to help some of these agencies who, who don't see the, their value of why they should be at the table? And, and we have some ways that we try to do that with cities to get them to understand that this is your goal too, right? that even though you're the Department of Transportation and your goal used to be about kind of moving vehicles, you also have to think about how you're um, working on this project that is a, a park that's gonna help mitigate flood in this city. And, and you really need to kind of think about the, the role you play at this table. And that's where the governance comes in. Uh, one more, I uh, guess we're doing a lot of front row here. So Thank you. My question is uh, towards how do you see the role of technology in all of this, um, it, in particularly um, in solving social equity related issues to all of this? Because uh, I'm from India and the fringes are the most vulnerable communities that have the impact. 
And if the input is not from the vulnerable communities toward these solutions, these boardroom solutions are never solutions, right? So how do, how do, you, how do you see technology being leveraged for inclusion? That, thank you for that question. I think that's a really important point to highlight that uh, resilience challenges deeply affect our most vulnerable people, places, and systems. And so one thing that our cities leverage data for is to identify those vulnerable locations and geographies, leverage that data to collaborate with those communities on those solutions. Um, one thing we have found in that collaboration is that it is difficult. There is a history of distrust at the community level, at government coming in and even wanting to talk about solutions in a different way. So how, how do you actually look at uh, community engagement from a resilience point of view and change the paradigm of how your city has done community engagement forever, right? And, and so some of our cities were brave enough to put that in their resilience strategy, that we need to completely change how we do community engagement. Why do we have seven different agencies going to the same community three weeks apart to talk about all these different issues? That's not fair to that community. We need to coordinate better at this level and really collaborate in a real way. So number one, leveraging the data to really layer that risk. So the risk is not just about the flood risk, but let's look at the socioeconomic indicators of those neighborhoods, prioritize those neighborhoods around resources, but really collaborate on what those resources could be in a very different way. Uh, just a footnote to that, because uh, you know, in, in, in our work, um, the decisions are gut-wrenching, right? When people have to move, when certain projects are not going to get built, how do you make those decisions? And I think there is a critical role for technology. Uh, in particular for us, we've done integrated numerical models, essentially, that allow us to look at all these different inputs, including social vulnerability. And ultimately, the science and the technology, I don't think, is the final answer. But what it can do is it can help with the conversation around the why so that the answer to the why question is not, well, you're gonna move because you have a, a, a powerful uh, state representative, uh, or you have a powerful uh, benefactor in your community, and this community over here is not. Instead, you're able to actually look at the pros and the cons, uh, do a, a rigorous alternatives analysis, and be able to come up with uh, a set of solutions based on the data, that you can then have that that, that back and forth participatory conversation around. Otherwise, it's somebody else outside of your community who's made a decision and then based on what? So this is a, an unfair thing to do to my friends on the stage here, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because they are my friends still. Uh, you know, 10X is an optimistic project. It's suggesting that if you look at this transect across the country, uh, we are still a first world nation, I'd like to believe, but we're on the front lines of social, economic, and climate change. So if we can't solve these problems, how are we gonna help others around the world? Uh, and I think I've got three optimists uh, up here with me. But you've got things coming out of late that are changing the context. Take David Foster Wells' book, you know, Uninhabitable Earth, or Nathaniel Rich, a New Orleans author who knows New Orleans well, talking about uh, losing Earth. When those kinds of things, and I think a lot of us have read these books, how, come out, how do they impact or inflect your work? How do you say, we're still plowing ahead, we're gonna get this done, when people are suggesting, my goodness, it might be too late, or we just better go, better go straight to not resilience, but adaptation. How do you work with that in your daily lives and the work that you do? I think it's a, I think it's a both and thing, and I don't, by both and I don't mean we should be optimistic and pessimistic both. By both and I mean uh, resilience and adaptation both have to occur. I, you know, I, th I think you have to be, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, pragma idealistic but, but, but pragmatic, right? Um, uh, in Houston, uh, because of the nature of our economy, it is hard to use the phrase climate change. Uh, it is not hard uh, to use the words sea level rise or extreme weather event, right? Those are pretty obvious to anybody who lives there. Uh, so I, I think it's possible to frame it in such a way that you're attacking the problems in front of you in an optimistic way. Um, uh, 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 and, and I and I don't think I really don't think that the prevailing zeitgeist is that uh, it's too late and we have to give up. I think the prevailing zeitgeist is uh, we are learning a lot about how cities work. We're learning a lot how, about how to make them more resilient, and and that learning curve's uh, 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 going really fast. 
and 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 so there's no reason not to be optimistic. You know, I, I, I agree with the premise of the question. There's a lot that can keep you up at night. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, in particular, you know, along the Gulf, uh, the Gulf Coast. Um, I take my inspiration from the fact, you know, our, our, our headquarters and our, our work is, uh, a lot of it is based in a delta. Uh, and we're working now in a lot of other areas of the country and the world, but we're based in a delta, which has, by its very nature, been constantly changing. So the notion that there is the way that it is, and it was that way, and it will, you know, how do we keep it that way, is a false premise. Um, and so the notion that we need to continue to adapt, well, in our geography, we've been adapting the whole time. The problem is when you say, you take a snapshot in time, we're gonna make uh, the Gulf of Mexico look like it did in the 30s. Well, that's not possible. So if you, if you have a goal that is impossible, it's very easy to get pessimistic and depressed about it. But if you begin with the premise that, well, it's always been constantly changing. How do we bring the best science, the best analysis, the best ideas from a transdisciplinary perspective together to guide that adaptation uh, process in a changing environment? Well, then, instead of worrying about uh, or you know, not sleeping at night, you put all of your energy towards those, uh, towards those solutions. So that, to me, is exciting. Uh, and it's also, we have no choice. It's, uh, it's the environment in which we live. So, Corinne, with nothing but zeros on the timer out there. I feel I'm definitely on the optimistic side. I think I get, I have had this amazing opportunity to partner with city governments and bureaucrats that are constantly just on a daily basis trying to be bold, right? And trying to think about bold, adaptive ways to reimagine their cities. And, and I think that the, the 10X corridor has the ability to be, you know, the laboratory for that. How can you just build a culture of boldness and understanding with the data, with the science, with all the opportunities out there, how we actually can reimagine our city for the better? Um, and like take this challenge as an actual opportunity for the future. So I want to thank my panelists. I think this is a perfect way to set the stage for a lot of great information you're going to hear throughout the day. Thank you, three of you, so much. I hope the audience will thank them as well.